Thanks so much for tuning in to check out this message. We hope that it helps you know Jesus' love for you more. If you have your Bibles today, uh, you can grab those. And we're going to look at two scriptures. We're going to start off in Hebrews chapter 6, which is where uh, we taught last week. And it's going to kind of be the foundational scripture for this series that we're in. Uh, this is our, our kind of our, our launch series called Anchored. We're going to talk about being anchored, what it looks like to be anchored. Uh, we're going to look all throughout scripture, different examples of being anchored. We're going to talk about the storms uh, and Jesus being present in those storms. So we're going to look at Hebrews chapter 6, and then we're going to spend most of our time today uh, in the book of Mark chapter 4. So you can go to Mark chapter 4 as well. But let's uh, start here in Hebrews chapter 6. If you don't have a Bible, um, we'll always try to put the scriptures up on the screen for you. Uh, here we go. Hebrews chapter 6, we're going to start in uh, verse 18. It says, Therefore... We who have fled to him, Jesus, for refuge can have great confidence as we hold to the hope that lies before us. This hope is a strong and a trustworthy anchor for our souls. It leads us through the curtain into God's inner sanctuary. Jesus has already gone in there for us. He has become our eternal high priest in the order of Melchizedek. What I love about this scripture and what we talked about extensively last week, and if you were not here, you can go listen to it online, go to our YouTube and check it out. But this is telling us that uh, we have this strong, stable anchor for our souls, that our souls are shaky, they are unstable, but we have the option, the, the, the solution for stability in our lives, and it's this anchor, it's this hope, who is Jesus. And what an anchor insinuates to us is that it, uh, we, we will need stability to endure the storms of life. That we, we're not rescued from storms. That a life following Jesus is not a life absent from storms. But it is a life where there can be stability to endure the storms. As much as I wish I could tell you that a life following Jesus is storm free, it's not the truth. That a life following Jesus has its challenges, has its difficulties, that we still are in a broken world. We are still uh, walking through what life looks like as a human being. And sometimes it can even be more challenging after choosing to follow Jesus. But we, although we are not provided the opportunity to be free from storms, we are given the solution that we can have strength, endurance, and stability to endure the storms of life. And it's not in and of ourselves. It's in this hope that we have uh, in Jesus. Will you turn with me now to Mark chapter 4? And uh, this is where we're going to spend the majority of our time looking at this specific situation where the followers of Jesus are in an actual storm. And we're going to make some observations about the presence of Jesus in the storm with his followers. We're going to jump into verse 35, but a little bit of context. This has been a really long couple of days of ministry, and this has been a long day of ministry for Jesus. There's been a lot of teaching. He's told some parables. There's been healings. He and his disciples have been going hard, and now it is the end of the day. It's that five o'clock feeling where you're about to check out, go home, relax. This is where we pick up after a long day of work. It says in verse 35, as evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, if you got a pen today, underline the words Jesus said. we got to understand up, up front, this is his idea. Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross to the other side of the lake. So they took Jesus in the boat, and they started out, leaving the crowds behind, although other boats followed. But soon, a fierce storm came up. High waves were breaking into the boat, and it began to fill with water. Jesus was sleeping at the back of the boat. I'm just really grateful for the New Living Translation that says the back of the boat. I was reading other translations, and it said the stern. And I've got no idea what a stern is until you turn the NLT, and it's, it's the back. Uh, some of you guys might have known the stern. Anybody know the other ones? Is there stern and the, the bow and the... And the poop deck. That's all, like, all I know. It's just the back and the poop deck. Uh, we get the NLT helps us less nautically uh, people understand. It's the back of the boat. Jesus is in the back of the stern with his head on a cushion. I love Jesus finds himself a pillow and, uh, and falls asleep. The disciples, they woke him up shouting, Teacher, don't you care that we are going to drown? Some translations say that we are perishing. We're actively dying in the moment. Verse 39, when Jesus woke up, He rebuked the wind, and he said to the waves, Silence, be still. Suddenly the wind stopped, 
and there was a great calm. Then he asked them, why are you afraid? You still have no faith. Or some translations say, where did your faith go? The disciples, they were absolutely terrified. Who is this man, they asked each other, that even the wind and the waves obey him? We're going to talk today a little bit more about the storms. And we're titling today's message, In a Storm, But Not Alone. And we see the followers of Jesus in a storm, super challenging, super difficult, yet not alone. Before we make these observations, I want to say um, sometimes the storms in our lives, the challenges that we're facing, they're due to our own sinfulness, our own bad decisions. Sometimes we create our own storms. And in a couple of weeks in this Anchored series, we're going to talk about that, that sometimes our storms are because of, of our own decision to sin, to not follow the directions of God uh, in our lives. But a lot of storms are storms that we did not choose. Storms that uh, are a result of something that was done to us. Sometimes our, our storms are COVID-19. Sometimes our storms uh, have, have to do with the way that we were treated as children or, or the anxieties or sufferings that we can, can walk through. And I don't know what your storm is today, but maybe you have a storm that uh, is even relational. Maybe a storm in your marriage. Maybe it's a storm that's financial. Maybe a storm that you didn't choose is a diagnosis for you or a loved one. There's various kinds of storms in our lives that we didn't pick, that we didn't choose, that are difficult, that we're trying to do what's right, we're trying to, to honor God, and yet we find ourselves in the midst of storms. Today we're going to make some observations about being in a storm and yet not being alone. If you're willing, would you just bow your heads? We're going to pray and uh, jump into this today. Lord, love you. Thank you that um, you don't leave us. You don't forsake us. Lord, I, uh, I don't know the storms represented in this room. There's some storms that we all seem to be facing in relation to, to what's going on with COVID and the decisions being made and the restrictions. And um, there's some tensions in our country whether that's political or racial or any other that we seem to all be facing together. But then there's individual storms, storms of individual physical health, storms of individual finances, storms of individual decisions and workplaces and, and marriages and family life and addictions and anxieties. Uh, God, you know those storms. Lord, I pray that today as we look at this text, we wouldn't just have more information about a story that happened long ago, but that we would see your character today in my storm, in these situations, that we would see uh, how you would challenge, encourage, and equip us in what we're facing today. We love you. You're amazing. Thanks for your word. It's your name we pray. Amen. Hey, I, uh, I think that we live in the greatest place ever. I love Missoula. I'm obsessed with this place. Uh, I, think it, I think it's the greatest. And there's a lot of uniqueness about Missoula. Missoula is known for a lot of different things, whether it's the more obvious things like uh, the University of Montana uh, or if it's a river runs through it. Uh, but Missoula is known for a lot of things. Uh, and uh, one of the things for Missoulians specifically, those of us that have been here a while, that we know Missoula is known for is the quick, dramatic changes in weather. I mean, it's just like a consistent joke. You don't like the weather, wait a few minutes. Like, we all know that joke uh, because it's true. The weather is crazy here. It changes so quick, whether it's in a day going from sunny to snowy or if it's like it was summer on Tuesday and on Wednesday we got a foot of snow. Like, it just changes dramatically. It changes quickly. And uh, uh, sometimes it's not just uh, changes of weather in terms of sun and snow, but uh, we get these, these winds in Missoula. You get the, the Hellgate Canyon winds coming through that just come up out of nowhere. Uh, one change of weather that happened so quick that, that uh, I was recalling as I was looking at this, this text was uh, my daughter Charlie, she's uh, 12 years old now, but her first birthday. Uh, we, we had our, our very first birthday party, our first birthday party to throw for one of our own children. So we went all out. And uh, at the time, we lived up in the apartments at the top of the South Hills on Uncle Robert Lane, which it seems like most of us make our way through those apartments if you grew up in Missoula. Anybody else had or have the privilege of living at the apartments on Uncle Robert Lane? There's a few of us. Okay. Uh, it seems like you just have to at some point. But uh, you're up on the top of the hill, and there was this park that we threw this birthday party for, for Charlie for, and uh, we had a bunch of friends over, and her birthday is in June, and it was hot, and it was sunny, and we had a little kitty swimming pool set up uh, because it was so hot out, and we set up this giant tent that we could sit under for shade as everybody ate, and we, we were having this party, and it was really warm, hot, everything's going on, we were serving the cake, 
uh, and all of a sudden, uh, this, this gust of wind hits, and it turns into this insane windstorm where we're all hanging out there, and all of a sudden, uh, there's, there's plates of food that are flying. Cake is now flying through the air. Uh, everything's wild, and the, the tent that we're under begins to take off. David, you were there. I remember this. David is uh, a little bit taller than I am, and I remember that the tent's taken off, and I'm like jumping, trying to grab the bar, and David finally runs over, and like he's holding it, and I'm dangling from the bar as David's actually holding down this tent. And uh, everyone's just running to different parts of the tent. We finally like trying to break it down. And everyone's running and trying to grab everything that's blowing away. And all the food and tables are sliding. Like this is an insane amount of wind. And all chaos is broken loose. And everybody is just running and scrambling to do whatever they can. And uh, finally, when we get everything kind of collected and the tent torn down, we look back over to where the tent used to be, where everything blew away from. And, uh, and my nan, God rest her soul, was sitting there totally unfazed, no clue what had just happened, just sitting there eating her cake. Her table had blown away. No one else is around, and she's just enjoying her piece of cake. It was the best moment. Like, we're all freaking out, and Nan's like, what's the big deal? I've got cake in front of me. Let's go. And I see such a similar moment here with Jesus and his disciples, where this storm, this wind comes, all chaos breaks loose. Everyone's running around trying to get, uh, get whatever task needs to get done, not just to not make a mess, but to actually survive. Their life is on the line. Meanwhile, Jesus is Nan, just so chill on a cushion on the stern of the boat. Like, this is just, Jesus is so chill. But I want to jump into the story, and if we look back at verse 35, it says that this was Jesus' idea. Jesus said, hey, it's the end of the day, evening has come, and Jesus said, let's get into the boat and go to the other side of the lake. So they took Jesus in the boat, and they started out, and then it says they were leaving the crowds behind, although other boats followed. What a beautiful scene this is at the end of a busy day. The sun is setting. This is about a five mile from uh, the east shore to the west shore of the Sea of Galilee. Uh, they're beginning to sail. The weather is calm. The sun is setting. The stars are coming out. It's just Jesus and his disciples. And they're hanging out on the boat. The crowds are behind. The work is over. They're throwing out their fishing nets, just hanging out at the end of the day. This is a pretty relaxing moment. At this point, the disciples know this is Jesus' idea. Let's get in the boat. Let's leave the crowds. And let's just go relax as the sun is setting. At this point, the disciples are thinking, Jesus, great idea. I like this. Um, this, is, this is very enjoyable. What we see here in this verse is Jesus. He speaks up and he gives his followers a destination. He gives them vision. He gives them direction. He gives them purpose. He gives them calling. He says, I want to get in the boat and we are going to go to the other side. Now, Jesus gives very limited information about what's going to happen between the moment where they get on the boat and the moment they step off the boat on the other side. He says, we're going to get in the boat, and we're going to get to the other side. And we got to give the disciples some credit here. It's, it's pretty enjoyable at the moment, but they heard the call of God. They heard where Jesus wanted to take them. He had spoken vision, and they heard it, and they obeyed it. They get in the boat, and they begin to do what Jesus directed them to do. Now, I believe that Jesus, he speaks to us. Many of you have heard him say, hey, this is the direction I want you to go, whether that is in relationship or in jobs or in decisions or in finances, uh, where you live. That, that he says, this is where I want you to go. But sometimes he tells us a direction. He speaks vision and destination, and yet there's limited details of what's going to happen between where we are and where he's taking us. And in verse 37, I mean, so far, so good. Jesus, I like where you're taking me. But things change in verse 37. It says, soon a fierce storm came up. High waves were breaking into the boat, and it began to fill with water. Historically, this fishing boat that's big enough to hold Jesus and his 12 disciples, that this is, this is a boat that has to hold between uh, at least 12 or 13 grown men uh, and higher. So likely, knowing these fishing boats, the, the size of them, it would have to be at least seven foot waves to get inside the boat. So this is no small waves, no small storm, that this is a chaotic storm that hits out of nowhere. So let's put ourselves in this scene. It's beautiful. It's relaxing. I got a breath of fresh air after working so hard. This is a reward from Jesus to just hang out. But 
what was peaceful, there's a little bit of a breeze that comes and, you know, kicks up the disciples' hair and their little man skirts are flapping in the wind a little bit and, and things are getting a little bit more, a little bit more rowdy. And, and they decide, hey, maybe we should bring in the nets, the wind, you know, we're rocking a little bit. And then it gets even more crazy and, and you know, the stuff in the boat is sliding side to side and, and it's much louder with the wind and they're like now it's trying to strap stuff down and they're holding on to the edges and they're yelling and giving, giving each other directions on how are we going to maintain this and make sure that nothing falls out. And, and as they're trying to fix something over here, a wave hits and it throws them off to the other side. And it is chaos at this point, to the point where the boat is filling up with water, at least seven foot waves. And now out in the middle of the lake, now it is dark, the middle of the night, what was beautiful and serene and easy is now difficult and fearful and challenging. And they're doing whatever they can to survive. No doubt they're trying to bail the water out, whatever buckets they have, or they're hitting it with their hands, scooping it out, trying to make sure that this storm doesn't take them out. That we see it go from beauty to storm to chaos. It goes from peace to uncertainty to worry for their own lives. I wonder, has life ever felt this way? That what was a calm, simple, enjoyable season out of nowhere is chaos and worry and anxiety and fear. Has life, even following Jesus, ever seemed to feel this way? We're out of nowhere, what seemed to be such a simple, beautiful, I thought this was good, you know, Jesus called me here, I thought I was obeying, things are great, and then all of a sudden, storms break out. And meanwhile, in verse 38, Jesus was sleeping at the back of the boat with his head on the cushion. First observation, how tired is Jesus? Like he's just sleeping through this storm. You know, this isn't just little waves. I mean, I see Jesus just like sliding back and forth, hitting his head on the boat as he's, and the water's coming up, the cushion on his face. Disciples are yelling, it's frantic. And he's just, you ever have a sleep like that? Those are the best, where you just sleep through anything. Jesus, he's sleeping through it all. But the location of Jesus is where I want to look right now. Where is Jesus in the midst of this chaos? He is right there on the boat with his disciples. That it is a mistake that we so easily make to assume that the presence of a storm means that God is distant. In fact, if you're taking notes, write this down. The presence of a storm does not mean that Jesus is absent. I think a lot of times this is the first wrong assumption that we also make. Well, if this is going on in my life, and I'm trying to do the right thing. And this chaos is happening all around me. God must be distant. I want to tell you the disciples and in your life as a follower of Jesus, the presence of a storm does not mean the absence of Jesus. That you may be in a storm, but you are not alone. Jesus isn't distant. Jesus just isn't freaked out. He's not worried. He's not concerned. And why? It's the same storm. He's in the same boat, the same waves, in the same water that's rising up. He's not in a different storm. He's not in a different set of circumstances. It's the same exact circumstances, the same exact danger. Why isn't Jesus freaked out? Because Jesus has already declared, we're going to get to the other side. He's already said it. He knows it. Now, Jesus, if he calls you to a destination, he will also carry you through whatever is between here and that destination. If he is going to call you to, he will carry you through. Write that down if you're a note taker. If he has called you to, he will carry you through. And Jesus has already said, we are going to the other side. Whether there is a storm or no storm, we're going to get there. So why am I worried? Why am I freaked out? Why am I going to be frantic in this moment when I already know that we are going to make it to the destination? You see, Jesus, he, he, he knew. And I want to tell you that just because Jesus isn't actively changing the circumstances of your life the way that you wish he would doesn't mean he's absent. Doesn't mean he's not understanding of where you're at right now. The first assumption we can so often make is that the presence of storm means the absence of Jesus. It says, uh, if finishing off in verse 30, it says, so the disciples, they ran to Jesus shouting. And get this, the disciples, they are officially yelling at Jesus. And they yell at him, teacher, don't you care that we're going to drown? Teacher, not Lord, teacher, don't you care that we are actively perishing, that we are drowning. 
says, Jesus, don't you recognize we have tried to do everything we can to save ourselves and it isn't working? We're experienced sailors. We've been in storms before and, and we know what we, we ought to do to try to save ourselves. We, we've worked hard. We're trying to bail the water out of the boat. But despite our best efforts, we have concluded that we are going to die. And you don't care. This is what they yell at Jesus. Don't you care? Jesus, this was your idea. You brought us here. You spoke this vision. You told us to get in the boat. You called us to this situation, and you are sleeping. You are inactive. And I, I wonder how often in our lives this is a frustration that we feel. Like, Jesus, I was trying to honor you. You called me to live in this location. I'm certain I heard you say that this was the job that I should get into. That, God, this marriage is something that I was so prayerful about before I got into it. God, you gave us the gift of these children. But right now, it's really hard. I, I tried to honor and obey and follow your direction. But this right now, this is hard. This is difficult. And if you are present, it doesn't seem like you care. This is the second assumption that we so often make. That if Jesus isn't absent, if he's actually present with me, then he must not care. In fact, in your notes, you can write this down. The presence of a storm does not mean that Jesus doesn't care. So often, this is where our minds go that, well, it might actually be easier for us if Jesus was absent. Because if he was absent, then it would, it, it, then we don't have to worry about if he cares or not. But if Jesus is here, if he sees what I'm going through, if he knows the storm, if he knows the struggle, if he sees what I'm suffering through right now, and it continues to happen, it must mean that he doesn't care. They make this assumption. And I wonder if you've ever been that guy. If you've ever been that gal. That, well, if you're present with me, and you see the pain, the hurt, the betrayal, the trial, the sickness, you see what's going on in my children's life, if you see this, you must not care. You see, what the disciples did and what we so often do is they were more focused on the worst possible outcome of their current situation than on the fact that Jesus was present with them in the midst of the storm. Jesus was with them. And he said, we're going to get to the other side. But they had lost their confidence in the truth that was spoken to them of the other side. And they began to believe, put more faith in their circumstances than in their Savior. But I think the big question is, well, if Jesus is present and he does care, then why the storm? And why is it not over yet? Like, well, why, if he knows, why the storm? And I want to be honest up front and say, a lot of times, maybe most of the time, I don't know. I don't know why you're in the storms that you're in. And I don't know why they're lasting as long as they last. I don't know. But I do know this, that we serve a God who is uh, an expert in making beauty out of brokenness and purpose out of pain. And I don't know why your storm, and I don't know what lessons or what's being uh, built inside of you in a storm, but I think we could all agree on this. It is the storms. It is the challenging seasons of life where on the other side, there is so much more growth. That our faith gets that much stronger when we go through a storm and we make it to the other side. That it is where uh, maturity takes place. Oftentimes, this is where influence is birthed because now we can understand other people's stories so much better. That there is greater influence now that we have walked through some. We can have greater compassion for other people that are in seasons of storm and hurt and trial. That there's so much that is built inside of us. That it is often the storms that build us into the men and the women that God has destined us to be. That it's what builds us into being the godly parents that God wants you to be. To, to be the leaders that he wants. It's in the storms that this maturity happens. Jesus also knew that his disciples, this wasn't their last storm. In fact, they're going to face a lot of challenging storms in their future. Even to the fact that one day they were going to give up their lives for their faith. That storms were not going to get easier. And he knew that faith needed to grow. That if they were going to endure not just this storm, but the future storms, faith needed to grow. In fact, if you finish this story out, when they get to the other side, what's on the other side is a demon-possessed man. Who they end up seeing set free. That nothing could, could restrain this man, nothing could set him free until the presence of Jesus shows up. And sometimes I wonder, what's on the other side of the storm? And maybe more importantly, who that is suffering oppression is on the other side of the storm that needs us to weather it so that we can have some faith and some perspective and the power and belief that our God can rescue them on the other side of our storms. I want to look at Romans chapter 5 real quick.
Romans chapter 5, and we're going to go to, to verse 1. It says this, Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ, our Lord, has done for us. Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand, and we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. We can rejoice, too, when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they help us develop endurance. And endurance develops strength of character, and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead to disappointment, for we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. I just love that it is in these storms, it's in these challenges that develop and develop and develop. And what we, are, what we end up with is hope. That we don't end up with like, well, with this despair that life is just a bunch of storms and tomorrow is going to be worse than yesterday. No, when we are walking through the storms with Jesus, there is a hope that is developed. That he has carried me in the past and he has built me and he has strengthened me and there is endurance and there is strength. And it develops hope inside of us. So I wonder if the question should transition from why is this storm happening to what is this storm producing? God, I don't know why the storm is happening, and I don't know why it's not going away, but what is this storm producing in me for who you're calling me to be in the future? What endurance are you building inside of me? What compassion are you building inside of me? What, what faith are you building up inside of me? I want to tell you, your storm is your story. And your story has power. And your story has influence. And your story can connect with individuals that are going to cross your path in the future. And it is the storm that builds your story. And you may not know why or how long it's going to last or what condition you're going to be on the other side. But what a story you're going to have to tell. I just think about it this way. If Jesus sees the potential in the current you and how that potential could, could blossom into the mature and influential future you, is it not his grace sometimes to allow the storm to develop us into the potential that's inside of us? That maybe God isn't distant, and maybe he actually does care. And what if it's that Jesus cares enough about you, and he cares enough about the oppressed people on the other side to say, I'm not going to abandon you in the storm, I'm going to be right here with you, and I'm going to carry you through as I have called you to, and I'm going to build you and mature you. And sometimes it is his grace that says, I'm going to hold you through the storm and develop you and build you and be your anchor to get you to the other side. So what if instead of complaining, we say, God, I don't know why the storm, I really don't like it. I wish it would go away. But if you're going to carry me to the other side, if you're going to build me, into who you want me to be. And if there's someone on the other side that needs my faith to grow right now and you're not going to abandon me, you're going to be with me, you're going to be my anchor, then let's go. I'm not going to lose trust. Verse 39, it says, When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and he said to the waves, Silence, be still. And suddenly the wind stopped and there was a great calm. Now I want to take just a moment to, to look at the content of the prayer that Jesus responded to. If we consider honest, open communication with God about what's going on on the inside, the way that we feel, the way we're thinking, this really brief exchange from the disciples to Jesus, this is prayer. This is them genuinely running to Jesus and expressing what's going on in their minds and in their hearts. This is prayer. And the content of their prayer was not even a request to stop the storm. They weren't asking him to. They said, Jesus. They said, teacher. Don't you care that we are going to drown? This is not formal. This is not delicate. This is not uh, a systematic. This is not a certain set of words to say in a certain way. In fact, this is accusatory of Jesus. They are yelling. They are shouting at Jesus. Jesus, you don't seem to care right now that I'm dying. And this is a prayer that lacks faith. It's inaccurate in its assumptions. It's rude, if not offensive. And Jesus, I'm so grateful that he doesn't turn and look at them and say, you change your tone, young man, if you want to talk to me. He doesn't say, hey, there should be a dear heavenly father at the beginning of that if you want me to listen to you. Like, let's be a little more orderly in the way that you pray. Uh, why don't I correct your false assumptions about me, and then we'll decide what to do about this. No, this prayer was yelling at Jesus. False accusations. 
but you don't care about my storm. And Jesus, rather than reprimanding and setting them straight, he responds. He's not turned away by their lack of faith. He's not turned away by their their false claims. Did you know that complaining can actually be a valid form of prayer? I don't think it should be your only form of prayer. But complaining, frustration, venting can be a valid form of prayer. If you don't believe it, just go read a couple of Psalms. And David, a man after God's own heart, is yelling at God to kill people. Like, he gets real upset. Like, he, venting can be a valid form of prayer. Jesus, he responds to this low faith, inaccurate prayer. And then he calms the storm, and in verse 40, he asks his disciples, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? Or what happened to your faith? Where did your faith go? They had again let their circumstances sway their confidence in their Savior. It it was all good before the waves. We like hanging out with Jesus. But everything changed when the storms came. See, what's different in this moment for the disciples is they had seen Jesus move powerfully on behalf of other people. They'd seen the miracles. They'd seen the cripple begin to walk. They'd seen the power of Jesus move. But as far as I can tell chronologically, this is the first time the disciples ever needed a miracle on their behalf. The first time that their future, their life was ever in jeopardy. And have you ever noticed it can be a lot easier to speak faith and life and confidence into somebody else's storm than your own storm? Have you ever noticed how easy it is to speak the word of God or to speak truth or encouragement or confidence when it's somebody else's sickness? When it's somebody else's broken marriage, when it's somebody else's loss of job, when it's somebody else's addiction, we can come alongside him and we can encourage and we can speak the word of God and there's that he's with you and we can speak encouragement. But I want to know, can you get to the point where it's not, I know that God can do this for you, but I'm also fully confident that he can do this for me. The disciples knew Jesus could perform miracles on the behalf of someone else, but when it was their turn to need a miracle, where did their faith go? I want to say this is so common, and I believe that some of you in this room and some of you that are listening online right now, this is what you needed to hear. I'm grateful that you can have faith and speak the word of God into somebody else's storm, but you got to know that same power of God is available for you that you're speaking to somebody else. Can you speak it to your own storm? Can you look at yourself and say, no, I am loved. I am valuable. I have calling. I have purpose. There's a future for my life. There is a reason that God has called me to the other side. There's somebody on the other side, and he wants to use me. And so he is going to carry me through. Can you speak life, not just to somebody else's storm, but can you speak it to your storm today? The disciples, they had to choose not just faith for somebody else, but faith for their own storm. Can you speak life to your own situation? I'm going to ask Spencer and the band, if you guys will join me. As we jump into verse 41, our last verse to say, it said the disciples, they were absolutely terrified. Who is this man? They asked each other. That even the wind and the waves obey him. This is an interesting conclusion to the story. You think about the highs and the lows and now back to a high of the excitement, the thrill, the storytelling of the amazing things they saw Jesus do and teach that day out on a boat, relaxing. And then the low of the chaos and the adrenaline and thinking they're going to die. And now we have this high again of we made it, that the storm is calm again. And yet, the disciples, they're not dancing around, high-fiving, hugging, laughing, like wasn't that crazy, as you would expect when the storm finally calms down and gets to the other side. We don't see the celebration here. We see that they were terrified. Their fear had shifted from fear of the storm to now this fear of Jesus. And if you look at this, this word fear, terrified, it's, it's this reverent, holy awe. They are taken aback and actually a little bit scared of the power of Jesus they just saw. Again, when they'd seen Jesus move on behalf of someone else, that's that's moving. That produces faith. But when they just saw Jesus 
carry them through the storm that they thought was going to be the end of their story. They're taken aback. Like he's, he's really powerful. He really cares, not just about them. He cares about us. He cares about me. He, he captivates them again. I mean, picture the scene. It's these 12 men who are in the middle of the night working so hard to bail the water out. Their adrenaline is pumping. They got water dripping off their beards. They're breathing heavy. And as the storm calms, no doubt, they've got their hands on their knees trying to catch their breath. As the water is just running down their faces. And it doesn't say explicitly that Jesus grabbed the cushion, curled back up, and went back to sleep. But that's what I see because that's probably what I'd do. But Jesus, he calms the storm. Conversation over. And the disciples catching their breath. They're just looking at each other, not celebrating, just trying to process what just happened. I mean, just minutes ago, they thought their life was over. They thought it so confidently that they're yelling at Jesus, you don't care about how terrible this is right now. And it's the end of me. And now it's calm. And they're catching their breath. And no doubt just looking at each other. With this look on their face of like, what just happened? And as they're looking around, taking this in, processing, one of them speaks up first. It's like, you guys. He's better than we thought. He's more powerful than I ever imagined. He still believed in me when I didn't believe in him. He knew what he was doing when he wasn't freaking out. He called us too, and he's going to carry us through. Start piecing these things together, and they're just like, guys, he's, we knew he was good. But we didn't know he was this good. And they're taken aback once again at the love and the mercy and the power of Jesus. And although I can't tell you why the storms that you're facing, I can say that sometimes it takes the storm to reintroduce us to grace again, to captivate us once again with the power of Jesus. Sometimes it takes the storm to get to the other side and have that wow moment of can you believe he carried us through that? When I was frustrated, and I thought he was distant, or I thought he didn't care. He knew what he was doing, and he never gave up on us, and he carried us through. I'll tell you last week, I'll make this a brief story. Before launch, I had this, this moment right up here where I absolutely lost it. It was like ugly crying, and I try not to like ever do that, but it happened. I was just sobbing, and my kids were like, what's wrong? All day, Finley was telling us, Dad was sad today. And it just like, I lost it. Because it was this moment that I didn't expect. Where long story, incredibly short, the last couple years have been really hard. And 2020 is probably not the ideal year to try to plant the church. It's been difficult. And there was this moment through all of the challenges and all the storm when we were here last week about to launch. And it was this overwhelming moment of, oh God, you knew what you were doing. All those moments of questioning and wondering and fear and insecurity and and not that those are absent now and gone now, but it was this moment of like, Jesus, you knew what you were doing. When you called us to, you're going to carry us through. And I hope that today, in your storm, my hope and my prayer, although I don't know when it's going to end, I hope that you get this wow moment of God, that was really hard. And I never would have chosen this season to look like that. I wouldn't have picked for this to happen. But God, thank you that you loved me enough and you believed in the future influence that I could have, that you carried me through a really hard season. And I hope that on the other side, there's moments of influence, but I hope there's moments of you just sitting there saying, wow, you're better. You actually weren't bad because you let me go through that storm. You were so good. You're so good. I really believe 
although we have individual storms, I'm believing with all my heart, the church specifically, we're going to be better after COVID because this has been awful. It's been so hard. This is ridiculous. And I don't know when it's going to be over, but what God is learning and developing inside of us corporately and individually and what it means to be a part of a community and engage with the body and support and lead and love, what he's building inside of us, we are going to be such a strong church on the other side. And I can't wait for this to be over. But Jesus, you called us to plant this church. You called us to, you're going to carry us through. And the other side, we're going to be so much better for it. I believe you're going to be better on the other side of COVID. You're going to be so much stronger, so much more understanding and compassionate that it's doing something inside of us. And your individual storm, the difficulty in your family right now, the difficulty in your finances, the difficulty in your job and your decisions, you're going to be greater. You're going to be stronger. Jesus called you too. He's going to carry you through. And he is building you to something great on the other side. And there's going to be moments where you say, wow, you're better. You're better. I'm going to tell you, church, I may not know your wind. I may not know your waves. But I know who has the power over them. And I know that he is near. And I know that he cares. And I know that he is the anchor. He is strong. And he is trustworthy. And he gives you stability for your soul. If you're willing and able in this room, would you stand with me? I want to be clear that I don't know if, how, or when your storm calms. This is not a message of saying, well, if we just pray together today, your storm will be over. I can't make that promise to you. I don't know if your storm will find resolution the way you're hoping. I don't know when and how it will end. And I can't promise the desires that you're seeking or what you're going to get. I will tell you, I'm willing to pray for it, though. Let's pray. Let's run to Jesus. Say, this is what we need. This is what we're looking for. This is where my heart's at. I'm not afraid to ask big requests, big prayers. As much as I can't promise that, what I do see here is the only one who has the power to calm that storm is Jesus. And I trust him to know what he's doing in your life. He's the only one that can calm it. I can't calm it. This church can't calm it. Jesus can calm the storm. I don't know if and when he will, but it's who we run to. I do want to consider though, what did the disciples do? They didn't get to calm their own storm. But what made a huge difference for them was when they took their eyes off of their storm where they dropped their buckets of their own efforts to save themselves and they ran to Jesus with a very small amount of faith or no faith. An inappropriate prayer from our perspective, wrong assumptions, they ran to him, small faith, inaccurate prayers. And Jesus, he exchanged his rest so they could have it. He exchanged his position so they could have it. I tell you, this is the gospel in the grandest form that we who cannot save ourselves simply turn to Jesus, even with small faith and inaccurate prayers. He exchanges his rest so we can have it. He exchanges his position so we can have it. He exchanges his righteousness for our filthy rags and he takes the punishment for our sin and he gives us life, abundant and life eternal. This is the gospel. I'd like to pray for you in a couple of areas today. If you're in this room, I'm just gonna ask you to bow your heads just for the sake of concentration and privacy. But I wanna pray for two areas and you may be one or both of these, but today you can say, I'm in a storm. We don't have the time to learn the details of your storm, but I'm willing to pray that your storm would be over. And again, I don't know if and when, but we're going to pray for it. If you're here today and you say, I'm in a storm, and I just want to take this moment to run to Jesus and say, I'm tired of trying to fix this storm on my own. I need your help. If that's you, you got a storm, just raise your hand. Just say, I need a storm, or I've got a storm, and I need Jesus in the midst of it. I'm going to pray for you in just a moment. You can put your hands back down. Second area you want to pray for, if today is a day where you want to run to Jesus, and it's not just because you, you've got a storm in your life, it's because you need to exchange 
your efforts, your works, your inability to save yourself for the provision that Jesus has already provided. This is a day where you, you can decide, I'm gonna choose to start following Jesus. Where I wanna exchange my hopelessness for his hope. I wanna exchange my instability for his stability. I wanna tell you a life following Jesus is not a life free from storm, but it is a life with an anchor, with stability, where he will carry you through the storms of life. Maybe you're here today and you don't consider yourself a follower of Jesus. Maybe you don't know what all that means to become a follower of Jesus, but there's a stirring in your heart today to say, I, I, I want to follow Jesus. If that's you, I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand, and I'm going to pray for you as well. You're not raising your hand for me or for God. This is you letting yourself know you're making a decision. Awesome. Put your hand right back down. Anybody else say, today's the day I'm going to choose to follow Jesus. Lord, I just thank you right now that you are our anchor. You are our stability. Lord, I thank you that you know every storm. And we ask you right now, we run to you. And I thank you that your answers, your attention are not dependent on how accurate our prayers are, how eloquent our prayers are. Uh, God, that, that you are not looking for us to express our hearts in certain ways. Uh, but God, you're asking for our honesty today. So Lord, we run to you right now. And, and God, you know every heart, you know every storm. Right now we say, this is where we're at. God, it seems like you're distant or it seems like you don't care or this is the healing that I'm seeking or this is the answer that I'm looking for. This is the marriage I'm asking you to restore. This is the addiction I'm asking you to break. This is the finances I'm asking you to, to, to provide. Whatever the storm is, God, this is we, we bring it to you and say, Jesus, we can't fix this on our own, but we know that you can. And God, we put our trust in you that on the other side of the storm, there's gonna be a greater faith a greater influence, and we say yes, that we want this to end soon, but we know that you're gonna carry us through to the other side. Lord, I thank you that you see not just the hands, but the hearts of those that say today is a day where I wanna choose, I wanna to decide to start following Jesus. God, I thank you that you are here, and you are right now internally in their hearts, in their souls, you are showing them your love and your grace. And I thank you that today is one of the greatest days that they will ever experience, where there is hope, and there is life abundant, and there is life eternal that is being brought to your sons and your daughters. Father, we love you. You're such an amazing God. We choose right now to take our eyes off of the storms and put them back on our Savior. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for checking out this content. We hope that it blessed you. We meet on Sunday mornings and would love to get to know you. Any information you need, you can find online at our website, goanchorchurch.com. Thanks so much. Have an awesome day. Oh, 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 oh,